Thank you for this opportunity to talk about nightmare treatment, pearls, and possibilities. I'm going to start with imagery rehearsal therapy and talk about some issues that we've been contemplating over the last several decades uh, regarding nightmare treatment and the use of IRT. I'm going to start with cognitive restructuring themes. There's been several instances of uh, themes and, and, and uh, connections that we try to make with our patients. The first one is whether or not the patient recognizes there's a relationship between nightmares and sleep problems, which surprisingly many patients have not. Uh, we also talk about original benefits with nightmares where in the very early going after the traumatic experience, there actually can be a discussion about how the nightmares might benefit a person. And then of course the trauma-induced and habit-sustained area uh, involves the discussion of how the actual cause of the nightmare may be the trauma, but over time the question becomes, uh, is it now a learned behavior? Is it something that's become a habit, so to speak? Um, one of the goals is to help the patient begin to realize that the nightmares may be an independent sleep disorder, if not an independent mental health disorder. So one of the main tasks in first broaching the topic with nightmare patients is to get across this concept of the nightmare misery index where we talk about all these difficulties a person can have with sleep, fear of going to sleep, awakenings and disrupted sleep, fear or anxiety about being uh, awakened during the night and then having to go back to sleep and more. Uh, we have found that by going down this pathway, especially myself being a sleep doctor, that it was an easier segue into helping people understand how we were going to approach the nightmare problem not as a mental health problem, but as a sleep disorder. The benefits of nightmare, it was something I learned from Dr. Michael Holifield, who pointed out that sometimes in the early going of a symptom manifestation, it's important to ask the patient whether or not there is something about this symptom that might be of benefit to them. And of course, when we showed this to patient at this particular slide and had this discussion, most were shocked and most were fairly speechless about how could nightmares have a benefit since they were thinking years down the line that the nightmares served no purpose whatsoever. Um, but it turned out with prompting, we could get many patients to talk about things like the nightmare serves as a remembrance of a historical event. It could be providing some sort of desensitization. Obviously, it could facilitate emotional expression and processing. The biggest one that almost always came up was the discussion of the nightmare serving as a warning mechanism actually providing information to suggest this could be helping somebody prevent themselves from having another trauma, and thus it could be thought of as a survival mechanism. The next three areas we looked at were nightmare sufferer identity, which is a big one that we noticed right away where nightmare patients seem to be very attached or invested in their nightmares for whatever reasons. I'm not suggesting this is a bad thing. I'm simply saying this might be the natural course of how people relate to the problem of chronic disturbing dreams and nightmares. Um, this may be something that stems from the fact that so many people who have nightmares on presentation speak about are they crazy for having the nightmares. So instead of them thinking of nightmares as a sleep problem or them thinking about nightmares having any explanation, many people are embarrassed about nightmares. And yet, once they get the nightmares and once they have it, they do seem to be resigned to it. And that resignation, in fact, may be fueling part of this nightmare sufferer identity that we talk about. The next area is linking imagery to dreams. Many people, when we tell them we're going to be using an imagery technique to help them overcome their disturbing dreams, um, they, they don't immediately understand that connection. So simple discussions about what you think about during the day, your daydreams during the day, can actually filter into the night. When they hear that, they believe then there might be a connection that gives a little bit of a rationale for them. And the last point here is that you really do have to evaluate patients, as I'm sure you all know, for their readiness and capacity to use IRT. Uh, we see Native Americans in New Mexico who have rejected IRT because they have a belief system that says you are not permitted to change dreams. Um, other types of patients just might not be appropriate, may not be ready, may not have the capacity to work with their imagination or their mind's eye. Uh, we always like to have our patients realize the mind's eye is extremely potent, but then again we also have to recognize IRT is not for every single patient with nightmares.
The next big issue is how to change the nightmares. This is a very big issue. Dr. Neidhart uh, trained us back in the late 1980s to use his conceptualization of change the nightmare any way you wish. It's a psychodynamic model. It's giving the patient the power to change it. We're looking to see perhaps if there's insights in the way uh, that person does choose to make those changes. After they've made the change, we discuss it as if that's their new dream that they're going to bring into their consciousness while they're sleeping, or some variation of that, and that they're not really going to be focusing on the nightmare. They're going to be focusing on this new dream. Uh, later on in our years of research, we discovered that many patients were using IRT for waking imagery and reporting benefits for that. And I, I do find that to be a very interesting uh, aspect that I delved into at a greater length in my book, Sound Sleep, Sound Mind, talking about the thoughts, feelings, imagery system and how people can use their imagination in that particular way. Now, the next big issue is the one that I have no clear answer for, which is how does IRT work? I don't really know, but when I talk to colleagues and patients, I usually use Deirdre Barrett's theory about dream metamorphosis, which I'm sure many other dream researchers and therapists have described in their own vernacular. Uh, in this particular one, if we imagined a trauma survivor uh, going into an appointment with a dream therapist, um, they would probably be describing a nightmare as a replay of the traumatic episode. That would not be surprising. In dream therapy, there would be discussions, no doubt, about images and emotions, and over several sessions, we would expect those dreams to change into symbolic nightmares as opposed to replay. And then with a few more sessions, we'd expect that eventually to metamorphosize into um, non-symbolic and yet still disturbing dreams. Eventually, if the dream therapy was successful, we would expect the individual to reach a state of no nightmares or a state of normal dreaming. And of course, it is interesting how many patients who report improvement with IRT will actually say words like, I actually don't dream as much now, or my dreams are a little bit fuzzier, which in some ways may suggest that the nightmares were stimulating them so much that that was a cause for why they were remembering the dreams. So, if the dream metamorphosis therapy uh, theory is correct, we're talking about you're working with dream emotions um, and that leads to processing and intel, which alters the dream content. Processing and intel, of course, refers to emotional processing and um, uh, emotional insights. Our word is emotional intel. So if we were describing how imagery rehearsal therapy could work, we are imagining that the insertion of these images into any of these places along the dream metamorphosis timeline could induce the individual to have a change just as they would if they had been in dream therapy. So the insertion of new imagery may trigger new dream images that promote the natural process of metamorphosis. We could also ask the question, does the insertion of the new imagery itself influence dream emotions and therefore, therefore influence the processing, emotional processing, and the emotional insights, which we call emotional intel, which then alters dream content. Now, the next big issue is creating the new dream. Um, who should change the nightmare? Well, as I've said from the outset, it's having the patient any way they wish is the one who changes it. Uh, but we see that other researchers may be doing this differently, other clinicians may be doing it interesting, uh, may be doing it differently, you know, based on their own backgrounds. Uh, what is the best way to change it? How should the change ideas be developed? Um, the point we get across is telling or advising telling or advising a patient about a change is not identical to the person actually changing it themselves. And the same concept, you know, here's how you might change it is not the same thing as telling somebody, change it any way you wish. Our goal is self-efficacy. And then again, we started with this model with Dr. Neidhart. It is quite possible that people with a mental health or psychology background may see this differently and feel there is a reason for this sort of coaching. Uh, this is obviously an area for research. The next area I want to talk about is PTSD and nightmares. Uh, many people back in the late 1990s when we first thought about the idea of going forward with this, um, I'm sorry, in the early 1990s, uh, said that IRT was not going to work for post-traumatic nightmares. Uh, obviously we had great success. You can see uh, by the two slides on the top, 
with the um, black circles, that nightmare frequency uh, went down considerably with IRT. You can also see in the bottom left-hand corner that the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index dropped considerably just by treating their nightmares. This hinted for us some problems about nightmare patients and co-occurring sleep disorders, which I'll mention later in the talk. And then last, of course, the reason the paper got published was because of the finding that treating somebody's nightmares actually led to a reduction, a noticeable reduction, in PTSD symptoms. And of course, the big question that came about after this was, well, wasn't it just because the nightmare symptoms went down, which of course are the intrusion cluster of PTSD? Well, in fact, it turns out it was all three. Here's the total scores of PTSD going down. Here are the intrusion scores of PTSD going down. Here is the avoidance cluster, and they're going down as well. And finally, here's the arousal cluster, and it went down as well. So you can see IRT led to a decrease in all PTSD symptoms, and this is why many people have said that IRT is a PTSD treatment. We do not. I'll explain later why we do not, yet I understand how some people could think that because it does affect all three clusters. And last in this area, we were able to conduct a study uh, with Brett Moore, who was in Iraq at the time, and we felt it very important to try a treatment with acute nightmares because that had not really been done. And uh, he was able to conduct a study with 11 soldiers. It's a very brief study, 30 days. Obviously, spontaneous remission is a weakness in the design. There was no control. You can see that the nightmare count drops, the PTSD severity drops, and the insomnia severity drops. Um, seven of the 11 patients in this reported clear benefits from using the IRT. But again, more research would be needed to really prove whether acute nightmare treatment could work. Now I want to move on and talk about populations. I feel really we must start to look at much more um, intensively and extensively if we're going to make big headroads into where uh, IRT is headed in terms of research fund funding and in terms of uh, clinical awareness and clinical capacity. Um, we've done one study on adolescents several years ago. There are a few studies out there on children and adolescents. Uh, I think this is a major, major area for growth because there are so many co-occurring issues that we find with children and adolescents when they do have the problem of nightmares. And that means that if we can actually capture their attention for this particular problem, it means not only can they gain the benefit of treating their nightmares, but it means we have the advantage of looking at these other co-occurring medical and psychiatric conditions that we see in patients that suffer from chronic nightmares. So I strongly think we have to find ways both for research funding and other clinical venues to promote nightmare treatment at a much earlier age. Now here are some other observations that we have had over the last couple of decades in doing this nightmare treatment research and the evaluation of nightmare patients and learning more things that we ever would have expected when we first got into this in 1988. The first thing was in the mid-1990s we began to notice that many nightmare patients have sleep disordered breathing problems. We were very surprised by this. It turns out one of the reasons I was sensitive to it was I was just completing my board certification in the field of sleep medicine and so my antenna were very high for looking for um, covert sleep disorders in patients and when I were seeing these nightmare patients, we would notice they had many other types of symptoms that we were not clear at first that they suggested a breathing condition, but later we discovered they were related. And one of the biggest ones was that people that have insomnia also have a lot of findings of sleep disordered breathing. This is one of the first papers we published uh, that has the title in it of Nightmares, Insomnia, and Sleep Disordered Breathing. And we coined the phrase Nightmare Triad Syndrome. And of course, we're talking about nightmares, insomnia, and sleep apnea. And wondered, of course, again, are they actually connected, or is this just a coincidence? Well, the nightmare and the insomnia part is rather obvious, because nightmare patients should have some degree of insomnia. But the covert part was the sleep disorder breathing. In the 1990s, we were developing the suspicion that many nightmare and insomnia patients did have sleep 
a breathing problem such as obstructive sleep apnea and upper airway resistance syndrome. In this first study that we did uh, in the early 2000s, we looked at acute nightmare patients and chronic nightmare patients, and we saw that they had many, many insomnia symptoms such as fear of going to sleep, awakening from sleep, difficulty returning to sleep, and fitful, restless sleep. Um, as I said earlier, though, nightmare patients do not naturally connect the insomnia to their disturbing dreams. It takes a bit of dialogue for them to understand that, but nonetheless, you can see that they presented and described many insomnia symptoms. So that part seemed very straightforward, not much of a surprise. The surprise came when we began looking at our nightmare insomnia patients or our nightmare patients or our insomnia patients and conducting um, objective sleep studies on them, polysomnography. When we started conducting polysomnography on these patients, it was around the same time that the new pressure transducer technology, it's called the nasal cannula pressure transducer technology, was being implemented in sleep centers around the United States and other parts of the globe. This technology allows you to evaluate with much greater precision sleep disordered breathing events. Uh, this technology, in fact, is now required uh, for all sleep centers in the United States and probably many sleep centers, again, around the world. It's not clear how well some people are actually using the technology or how well they're scoring these breathing events, but I'll talk about that in this next slide. As you can see in the top two rows, in these patients who are crime victims with nightmares and insomnia, of which there are 44 patients, they had a small to moderate number of apneas and hypopneas. Apneas and hypopneas are the two major sleep breathing disorder events described by most sleep centers. And you can see the number total 17 events per hour. That's only in the mild to moderate category. But using the pressure transducer, we were able to show that they had an additional 24 breathing events, which go by various names called RERAS, upper airway resistance, flow limitation, whatever name you call it. It means if you add the two together, the 17 and the 24, you get 41. Well, that's, that's a frequency of sleep breathing events that's in the severe category. And so when you count all three of these obstructive breathing events, you actually get a much different picture and realize these are serious breathing disorders that these types of patients are actually suffering from. And we published many papers on this um, in the uh, early 2000s uh, over the next decade from that point forward showing these kinds of connections in various types of PTSD patients and insomnia patients and nightmare patients. One of the questions that immediately arose was, why would it be so easy to miss the diagnosis of these patients? So we did a study on that, looking for the signs and symptoms of sleep disordered breathing in trauma survivors and comparing them to sleep center patients. And if you see the first column talks about SCP, which are the sleep center patients, and the TRS, of course, is the trauma survivors. All the patients in this uh, study, which is 89 in each group, 178 patients, all of them have been diagnosed with sleep apnea. Now what we look at is how did they present? And you can see that for the sleep center patients, um, they are coming in the door saying, I have had somebody see that I stopped breathing, sleep apnea. Or 70% said they had loud snoring. Look at the trauma survivors and you see they have very little um, uh, witnessed apnea and very little uh, snoring, less than 25%. Now switch it around, what did the trauma survivors come in uh, to, in their presentation? And the answer was 60% had sleep onset insomnia, 70% had sleep maintenance insomnia, and 73% presented with nightmares. So the bottom line is that PTSD patients with insomnia or nightmares or both are presenting just like a psychiatric patient would with insomnia and nightmares or both. And yet that actually seems to be the tip off. They may also have a sleep breathing disorder because they're not emphasizing their sleep breathing symptoms. Now this brings us to trying to draw a connection
between these three disorders of the nightmare triad syndrome. If you look at the second level where it says chronic insomnia, I want to walk you through what really came about through the research of a doctor series in Montreal in 1994, where he took normal sleepers and stimulated them with a bell tone while they were sleeping several hundred times during the night. This obviously led to sleep fragmentation. Well, the amazing thing was when he tested them again just one night later, their airway was no longer functioning the same way as it had before during that initial research. So again, think about this. They went from normal sleepers and normal breathers to showing signs of some airway collapsibility just after one night of sleep fragmentation. In the graphic, you can see that chronic insomnia obviously can cause the same thing, sleep fragmentation. And many people now are beginning to speculate on this relationship where sleep fragmentation itself, for whatever reasons, may be triggering changes in airway collapsibility and in fact making vulnerability to airway collapsibility. Obviously, if the airway is more collapsible, it could either cause or aggravate sleep disordered breathing, which of course produces more sleep fragmentation, which again produces more airway collapsibility, more sleep disordered breathing, eventually more chronic insomnia. Well, everything I've just described could be said about nightmares. The nightmares, uh, obviously, as we've said, can trigger bouts of insomnia. The nightmares also can cause their own form of sleep fragmentation. But the big one, and the one that really needs a lot of research, is the question of airway collapsibility. Because everything I've said fits just in the sense that nightmares could cause the insomnia, sleep fragmentation, and produce the collapsibility. But I would imagine that virtually everybody who's listening to this, who has been working with patients who have nightmares, has met at least one patient, if not 50 patients, who's mentioned that they have awakened from a nightmare gasping for breath, choking for breath, not being able to catch their breath. Well, why is that happening? Is it out of fear only, or is it actually a sleep disordered breathing event? And I think this is a very important area ripe for research. My final slides are on how would we approach this airway collapsibility issue as it would relate to nightmare patients. We did a study in 2004 that described patients who'd used PAP therapy and seen their nightmares reduce somewhat. That was a very small study. Uh, Tamana and colleagues did a much larger study uh, looking at patients with nightmares and PTSD. You can see that he did a before and after. The gray is before. The, the darker color is after. Um, he looked at patients who had a non-REM predominant sleep apnea and a REM predominant sleep apnea. And both sets of patients saw marked reduction, basically 50% reduction in nightmares using PEP therapy. Now, using a metric called compliance, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit more, is that that means what insurance carriers tell doctors is how you meet insurance coverage to get your PAP machine. It's not really based on science. It's arbitrary. And it's actually designed so that insurance companies can remove the device from someone who's not using it so they don't have to pay for it. Um, there's not really good literature showing that compliance does anything more than that because obviously the more you use the PAP machine anyway, the better off you're going to be. In this particular study though, he did show that the more compliant you were, you can see that the number of uh, nightmares uh, is remarkably reduced once you get down to full compliance, which is around 100%. The number the insurance carriers use is 70%. And you can see even at 70% compliance, which generally means using it about four hours a night for five nights a week. That's about, that's about 70%. If you do that, you get down below 50% reduction. So compliance is really more of a categorical variable, not so much a continuous variable. We were interested in looking at this from a dose response point of view. So we've recently conducted a study um, looking at a non-randomized retrospective review of 100 some patients with chronic nightmares all who were using PAP therapy. And uh, in the slide on the left-hand side, we have the compliance that talks about the same standard uh, metric. But on the right-hand side, which I've blown up for you now, this is used something a little bit more based on hours of use. So the people in the left-hand group that are users, they 
must be using it 20 hours or more. Um, and you can see they actually were using it 42 hours a week. Um, compared to the partial users on the right-hand side, that were not even getting in 15 hours a week. So that breaks down to 85 users versus 20 partial users. And you can see in the two slides that the users, uh, oh, and let me mention that we did not look at nightmare frequency. We used the DDNSI, um, which many of you use. Thank you for using that scale. Uh, and we used the cutoff of 10 for um, nightmare disorder. And you can see that in the user group, they went from about 14 uh, down to about 6. So a market change in the DDNSI with the user group and less change, but some change, in the par partial user group. Uh, if we look at this by the categorical variable of did they no longer meet criteria for the DDNSI uh, level of a disorder, you can see on the left-hand side that seven, nearly 75% of the patients no longer met criteria for a nightmare disorder. And on the right-hand side, for the partial users, even with just some benefit, um, a little bit less than 50% met criteria for uh, no longer having a nightmare disorder. Uh, putting it all together with 105 patients, we were looking for the actual number of hours of use uh, as it related to the change in DDNSI scores, and we actually did show a significant finding uh, with a reasonable correlation coefficient of you know, 0 0.29. Now, to summarize, I just want to make a few key points, and that is, in terms of study types, I want to mention that from a sleep perspective and from the fact that when we got into this, many of the people who were doing IRT were actually doing it through sleep centers, behavioral sleep medicine specialists, and very few of them were using exposure. Obviously, there's a whole other direction in this research by people with mental health and psychology backgrounds who have been using and adding exposure. I just want to put in my two cents that I welcome this. I think this is fantastic. I think more of this research needs to be done. I think it absolutely needs to be sorted out whether or not there are certain types of patients who should be getting IRT with exposure or IRT without. I think it's very important to figure out whether there are certain types of patients who should be starting with IRT in a certain type of program that may or may not have the exposure. So I absolutely welcome it. We did this back in 1988 and from that point forward with two psychiatrists, Dr. Kellner and Dr. Neidhart, who were not promoting exposure therapy with IRT. And we tried to carefully design our protocols to very much limit the exposure therapy. Not a knock on exposure therapy. That's just the way we do it. We thought that would be a better model, especially since I was taking over the reins of the research as a sleep doctor. Second, I would very much like to see more studies targeting insomnia and nightmares together. I think we have such powerful tools with IRT and CBTI, and there's so many patients that have this combination, and I think we're going to be able to prove that there is so much more benefit by giving them both of these treatments, and it would be wonderful to see if this is, it becomes a standard of care which um, many psychologists and sleep professionals and other types of mental health providers gravitate towards and learn to use and learn to apply because it's so powerful and we can help so many patients. And of course, last, I would like to see more research on the PAP therapy studies in combination, by the way, with IRT and the CBTI, uh, but also PAP therapy on its own because we're so interested in finding out why, of course, something like PAP therapy, just like why Prazazine would be working to reduce nightmares. Last, just a comment again about study cohorts. I think it's absolutely critical that these first two points on acute nightmares in children and adolescents, I think we really have to find um, ways to do uh, nightmare treatment on acute nightmare sufferers. I, my hunch is the only way to do that is through the military. That's probably going to be the only um, uh, locale or venues that will have this type of sample. I think it would be extremely important to do this research and find out whether or not it could actually make a difference in preventing or diminishing the subsequent development of uh, PTSD. Uh, and then again, to repeat, I think there's so much we have to learn about treating nightmares in children and adolescents, particularly so we can see whether or not we can have an impact on the co-occurring medical and psychiatric conditions that we see so commonly in 
in children and adolescents who have nightmares. And then last, getting back to this point about IRT as a treatment for PTSD. Um, there are anecdotal reports, and I've heard them both personally um, and through you know, communications with individuals and colleagues who reported to me. They've treated people with IRT, and the patient's PTSD seems to get markedly better. They didn't even go for additional treatment. But I don't think that's really the most appropriate way to look at IRT. I look at it as a potential first-line treatment for people who may not be ready for EMDR or PE or CPT, all of the major proven um, treatments for PTSD, which I hardly endorse and recommend for those patients who need it and regularly refer patients for those things for their PTSD. My point stems from the fact that we have always believed that some people just are not ready for the more intensive exposure therapies when they are first introduced to the idea of treatment and that the idea of sleep treatment proves to be more attractive. And therefore, if somebody starts out with IRT for nightmares or CBTI for insomnia, that may be a much more welcoming and attractive way for them to get involved in treatment. As it turns out, a couple years ago, I finished a two-year program traveling around the United States and once in Landstall, Germany, to treat, correction, to train um, a couple of hundred mental health providers working at these military bases that I travel to in our sleep dynamic therapy program, which is a combination of IRT, CBTI, sleep-related sleep emotion-focused therapy, and also discussions about treatment of PAP therapy and leg jerks. In other words, putting together all these sleep disorders in uh, trauma survivors and other mental health patients. When we did this training, many of the participants would come up to us and tell us that they were already using some version of IRT and CBTI. I would say roughly uh, 10 to 20 percent had already begun using it. But the most interesting thing that a handful or just a fewer would come up and tell us they were specifically using IRT or CBTI before going into the PTSD treatment. In other words, they were actively engaging their patients in making a decision that they did not want them to start with exposure therapy. They wanted them to start with IRT or with CBTI. And they did this for two specific reasons. One is they knew that if they could get a treatment response with IRT or CBTI, then the patient could be sleeping better. And if the patient was sleeping better, they expect them to do better with exposure therapy. The second thing would be just the very fact that they had done a treatment that was successful might motivate them to go further in their treatment and recognize that the particular therapist that was doing the treatment had that much more to offer to these patients. So that's how we look at IRT and to an extent CBTI with the idea being that you can do these things first and that it may make a very big difference in helping the patient feel some level of, of success that then further motivates them to continue on to go into a more deeper, into a, into a deeper and more intensive therapy for PTSD. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk about nightmares.